So um, it's uh, wonderful to see so many familiar faces, but as my wife will readily uh, attest to, I don't get the names of my kids right, uh, even though the faces may be familiar, so I apologize if the name doesn't completely come off my tongue. In clinic, I'm prepped with a chart, and, it, and it's uh, always very helpful for those of us with poor memories. Uh, I've been tasked to kind of try to create an even playing field. This is such an, a, a disease that can cause uh, so much confusion, uh, not only among patients and families trying to learn about it, but frankly among physicians. And part of, part of our job, uh, Pam's and mine, is to go around the country trying to teach physicians the nomenclature, the treatments, the categorizations of different neuroendocrine tumors, because it is a rare tumor in community practice. And uh, it's not uh, surprising then that physicians might not understand all the nuances associated with these. So I'd suspect at the end of today that you will know a fair amount more than many community uh, physicians on this particular disease. Uh, now, I'm not going to go into details of each of the disease subsets, but this morning I just want to give you a sort of a flavor for the spectrum of disease possibilities and the nomenclature we use to describe it, so that when you read something about it, you'll have some context. So this is, uh, you know, you're on Stanford campus. This is uh, your Tumor 101 course. First of all, disclaimer. And the events I've put together before, uh, Pam and I put together, uh, there is almost always one or more people who are here with the wrong diagnosis. Now, uh, I'm more than happy to, to meet with you at lunch. Uh, Pam is too, any of our physicians would be. If you happen to be here with a small cell neuroendocrine tumor from the lung or a large cell neuroendocrine tumor of the lung or an adenocarcinoma with neuroendocrine features or something called a goblet cell carcinoid, those are tumors, although they have neuroendocrine or carcinoid in the name, are not actually neuroendocrine tumors that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, and, and so much of what we'll be talking about today would not pertain to those patients. But I don't want you to feel left out in the cold if you happen to have one of those diagnoses. Now, I'll also mention that uh, in uh, the history of this goes back to 1907, uh, when a, a, a German pathologist termed, the, termed this carcinoid, and, and carcinoid was for kind of like cancer. Not really like cancer, but kind of like cancer. Yes, it could grow, yes, it could spread, but it did so at a glacial pace, and therefore it didn't acquire the cancer name, which is carcinoma, which is what we term, the term we use for both, most cancers. In terms of the uh, incidence, meaning the uh, numbers of patients who are diagnosed each year, it's considered a rare tumor. And here you can see that uh, Overall, the total of the, of the neuroendocrine tumor is about five per 100,000. So you're not quite one in a million, but five per 100,000 is a, still a fairly rare uh, a tumor type. But that, that belies the prevalence. So instead of incidence, which is really the number of new cases diagnosed per year, when we think about the number of people in the population who have that tumor, the, that's called the prevalence, the prevalence is actually fairly high. So if I just look at GI cancers, col colorectal cancer is the most common of the GI cancers, but neuroendocrine is the most, second most common. In fact, it's more common in the population than stomach and pancreas combined. Uh, why is that? It's, the answer is quite simple. Uh, people with stomach cancer, pancreas cancer don't survive very long, on, statistically, whereas people with neuroendocrine tumors can survive a long time. And if you have a disease that allows you to survive decades, then, uh, then there are going to be more people with that disease that accumulate. And therefore, there are, that's why it's not as rare as people give it credit for. Not only is it not as rare, but the incidence is increasing. If you look at that blue line there, that's all cancers. And, and fortunately for all cancers, uh, at least in the United States, there's been a slight decline over the last few years. Uh, but if you look at the red line, those are neuroendocrine tumors. It's rapidly increasing. Now, I don't want people to go home thinking that this is an epidemic. I think that this is, in part, the fact that we do a lot more scans than we used to. If you eat a bad taco and have a bellyache, you go in the emergency room, you get a CT scan, and whoops, they find a little neuroendocrine tumor. Maybe that neuroendocrine tumor might never have bothered you, but they found it, and now we have to deal with it. Uh, so uh, same is with colonoscopies. We're doing many more colonoscopies this decade than we've ever done before. And as a result, we're, we're diagnosing more small carcinoid tumors. We actually don't know what to do with some of those small carcinoid tumors. It's sort of a dilemma as to who needs more aggressive treatment once we pluck out a carcinoid tumor from the rectum. 
But that's, that's largely responsible for that rapid increase. And there may be other factors that are responsible for the increase that we're still looking into in the research world. I think I'll pause here and, and just uh, ask a very simple question. For a 42-year-old woman with metastatic breast cancer, the following treatments are reasonable. Surgery, radiation, chemotherapy. Three modes of treatment. For a 42-year-old woman with a neuroendocrine tumor, the following treatments are reasonable. Observation, which is to say no treatment. Surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, targeted therapies, hormonal therapies, uh, a peptide receptor radiotherapy, radioembolization, chemoembolization. There's actually a large number of, tr of treatments that are potentially used for different subsets of neuroendocrine at different stages of the disease. And, and that's part of what makes this confusing. There's not one treatment to, that we can just say, oh, you need a little bit of surgery, a little chemotherapy, and you're done. Neuroendocrine tumors are much more complicated than some of the other carcinomas where we have very good data that tells us that just, you just need chemotherapy and you're done. So it's, it's, a, it's a multitude of potential treatments that always tells you in medicine that there's no one perfect treatment whenever we have a lot of different treatments, okay? So a little bit more nomenclature. The nomenclature has really gotten in the way of, of this uh, disease, of understanding this disease. And in, in the past, these were known as apodomas, uh, GEP nets, islet cell tumors, uh, the, the carcinoids that arise in the pancreas are, are, were once called islet cell tumors. Carcinoid itself is a name that we in the scientific world try not to use because it means some, one thing to some people and another thing to other people. So the term that we use is uh, well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors rather than carcinoid. Uh, but if they arise in the, in the lung, they actually have a different classification system. They are either atypical or typical carcinoids. And at one point, the classification was based on embryology of the tissues that the disease arose from. So they were divided into foregut, midgut, and hindgut classifications. These are really uh, classifications that we try not to use anymore. So how do we, what's modern net nomenclature? We try to uh, classify by the organ of origin, understanding that we don't always know where it came from. Sometimes we'll find spots in the liver and we don't know where the primary tumor came from. But other times we'll find, well, this is a primary tumor in the pancreas, and we know that that's a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, or a pr primary tumor in the appendix, and that's an appendiceal neuroendocrine tumor. We'll also denote whether it's secreting or non-secreting, which is to say, is it making some hormones? Is it making some hormones that we can detect in the blood? And sometimes that's glucagon. If, is it making insulin? If it makes insulin, then your blood sugars go down and you have hypoglycemia, you can become very ill. Um, and so there are insulinomas that can occur in the pancreas, and we can measure the insulin levels, we can measure your blood sugar levels. There are different ways of monitoring uh, uh, diseases that make these, these certain substances. And as you know from the second one, serotonin, which is the one, uh, one of the substances that can cause the carcinoid syndrome, the diarrhea and flushing associated with carcinoid syndrome, is due to some of these substances that are, that are released. We also, uh, we also um, classify these as functional and non-functional. Now, functional is not just making the hormone. It's having uh, particular side effects from that hormone. So you can have a very high serotonin level, or what we measure in the urine is 5-HIAA. If you have a very high level and don't have the carcinoid syndrome, we don't call that a functioning tumor, because you have to have the symptoms to call it a functioning tumor. So, um, so these are different uh, uh, sort of adjectives we put on top of the terminology of well-differentiated, poorly-differentiated tumors. Now, the well-differentiated, uh, just at breakfast, somebody asked me this question, what is differentiation? If you imagine for a moment that all cancer cells arise from normal cells, so a cancer has to arise first from a normal cell, and it acquires certain mutations that make it into a cancer cell, and then you, that, that, that cancer cell grows to be a spot that you can see, you can biopsy, you can look at under the microscope. If, when you look at it under the microscope, if that those cells sort of recapitulate the morphology, the size, the cell-to-cell -cell architecture of the normal tissue, then you call that well-differentiated. 
if those cells bear no resemblance to the normal tissue, if those cells are very chaotic, very different sizes, they don't seem to respect each other's cell boundaries, it's just a sheet of ugly looking cells, that's poorly differentiated. And another sort of clinical term that you can link to that is well differentiated generally, but not always, means well behaved, and poorly differentiated means poorly behaved. That, that speaks to the aggressiveness of the cancer, the growth rate and the uh, uh, tendency to spread. So, so this is a pathologic term. The pathologists look, at the, uh, look through the microscope and very carefully try to tell us whether it's low grade or high grade. And I think that this is one question that uh, Pam and I will get on the phone and call the pathologists about more often than anything else, because we'll ask them, how sure are you that this is low grade? How sure are you that this is high grade? Because that will influence our treatment, as you'll hear about later today. Now, the net biology, the neuroendocrine, where does that term come from? I told you the carcinoid was just made up by, some, by a German pathologist in 1907. The neuroendocrine term comes up from the fact that uh, these are endocrine produce, producing cells, so they can make hormones, and they can also respond to hormones. Not the hormones that Barry Bonds would take, not the hormones that are, that are sex hormones. These are hormones that you've never heard of. These are hormones like somatostatin. Uh, and these hormones uh, can have an effect on the cancer cell, and the cancer cell can release hormones that, uh, that have effects on other tissues in the body. We call them neuroendocrine because these hormones can be triggered to be released by nerve impulses in the gut. And, and it's physiological, actually. So these cells, which normally line the gut, are triggered by nervous impulses to secrete things to help you have bowel movements. And that's what they're, what's one of their normal functions. The problem is when they become a cancer, they, uh, they are always producing those hormones inappropriately and can sometimes cause diarrhea as a result. When we study the molecular biology of these uh, tumor cells a little bit, we can find that they have receptors. So if this glob on the, on the right here has, let's see if this pointer works there. If this, this is a tumor cell, sitting in the, uh, just sitting by itself, there are a number of receptors on the cell surface that are called somatostatin receptors, and there are five of them, one, two, three, four, and five, and they're a little bit different. And each one of these receptors can send signals to the cell for the cell to do something. Sometimes it tells the cell to release substances. Sometimes it tells the cell, better get ready to grow, we need to divide. And sometimes it tells the cell to just relax. There's no reason to divide right now, no reason to, to release substances, let's just, let's just hang where we are. So these are signaling mechanisms that cells use to, to influence behavior. Tumor cells use them to make them grow or release substances. But we can take advantage of that, of course, by using octreotide, which can bind to these receptors and block them. So octreotide can bind to these receptors and turn off some of those signals. And you'll hear a little bit more about that this afternoon. So 80% of neuroendocrine tumors, not all, but 80% of neuroendocrine tumors have these signals, and we can take advantage of that by using octreotide not only as a treatment, but as you'll learn later today, as a diagnostic test. Genes play a role in every cancer, and uh, we're just now starting to learn the genes that are, that are associated with uh, neuroendocrine tumors. In pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, we know that there's a handful of genes that have been recently identified that can be turned on or turned, or turned off and result in pancreatic cancers or pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and actually drive that cancer to grow. Um, in the mid-gut carcinoid just next week, so it hasn't even been published yet, but next week there'll be a publication from colleagues at uh, Mass General Hospital where they'll, they will announce that 10 to 12% of mid-gut carcinoids have a defect in something called CDKN1B. You don't, there will be no tests, so don't worry about memorizing that. But this is, a, uh, this is a gene that when it goes awry, we have drugs that we think can attack that. They're not approved yet, but they're in clinical trials. And so we're already working on, uh, with two companies, to come up with clinical trials for mid-gut carcinoid for those people who have those genetic defects. So what I've asterisked here are the ones where we actually have drugs that attack these particular markers. This DAX ATRX is a brand new finding that was not previously known to be associated with any cancers. And now we know it's highly associated with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and glioblastomas. What does this have to do with brain cancer? Nobody knows, except that both are driven by DAX and ATRX. 
And there's a lot of work being done right now to try to understand, uh, number one, exactly how this works, and number two, how can we intervene? How can we develop a drug to intervene in that process? So the genes are clearly important. But, you know, where the rubber meets the road is how does the tumor behave? We can, we can learn about the genes, we can look at the pathology, we can call it low grade or high grade, but how does it behave in the person? And, and fortunately, I guess, neuroendocrine tumors are slower growing. I, I don't like to use that term with patients because it's never slow enough if you're the one with the tumor, okay? It's, it's not all that reassuring to say, well, the guy down the hall has a faster growing tumor, so that, that's, not, not, that's not much uh, reassurance. So the slow gro growth uh, is, is sort of classic uh, to these tumors, and, and, and hence the term carcinoid, because it doesn't actually grow like a carcinoma. Uh, sometimes they grow so slowly we don't need to treat. Sometimes they grow so slowly we don't need to treat. Now that's a kind of a complete different uh, uh, mindset from anyone with a carcinoma. You would never just let a carcinoma grow you have to think about who do you need to treat with neuroendocrine tumor. And that's why observation is truly one of the reasonable treatment, one of the manage management op options. The first person I saw as a faculty member, who's not in this room right now, um, who is doing fine, by the way, 22 years ago, came to me with a belly full of disease and a liver full of disease. And, I, and he was, had been told that it was carcinoma. Fortunately, it was carcinoid. We had the pathology reviewed, and it was carcinoid. And, I got a, and he was scared to death, and his wife was scared to death. He had just retired, and he was looking forward to retirement, and my goodness, I'm cut with this disease. I, I um, got a scan on him after a surgery, got a scan three months later, got a scan six months later. We got a scan every year for about 10 years. I started getting scan MRIs every two or three years. Every MRI said, no significant change. No significant change. But if you looked at an MRI from 10 years ago, you'd see the significant change. That's how slow growing his tumor it was. So, uh, so that's, that, now that's, not, that's not that common, but that's how slow this could be. If I had started treating him with octreotide or anything back then, I'd be taking credit for how well his tumor has behaved. But in fact, that was just the slow growth of his disease. As I mentioned, tumor cells release these amines or peptides or the small molecules in the blood. And, and we can use them as tumor markers, even if they don't cause specific problems, we can use them as tumor markers. And sometimes these tumor markers will also cause secretory syndromes, and that's where the term functional comes from. Also, these tumors can be very hypervascular. That's another characteristic of these tumors that's unusual. They have a very rich arterial blood supply, and I think a picture tells it, tells it better. On the left, you'll see a liver. Here's the liver, and here's the liver. This is the same patient. And these dark spots are typical metastasis from colon cancer, lung cancer, breast cancer. This happens to be colon cancer. They're very dark compared with the normal liver. Why are they dark? Because they actually get less blood supply than the normal liver. What's, lot, what's white here is the iodine contrast that comes in with the, with the CT contrast. So you can see the normal liver gets more blood supply than these tumors. But look over here, this is a neuroendocrine tumor. All those little white spots are like light bulbs. They light up with it when, when the arterial contrast comes in. And here are a couple large tumors that just get bright white compared with the normal liver. So that's very different from other tumors. That was the first clue. We also stage tumors. Staging defines the extent of the disease. And, and just more importantly, where is it and can it be removed? So it is the first step towards determining what types of treatment make sense. As I mentioned, we grade it. That means the pathologist looks at it on the microscope and grades it, one, zero, grades it one, two, or three, poorly differentiated or well differentiated. The slow growth, uh, in terms of taking advantage of net biology, slow growth allows us to just watch some of these tumors. So again, we, we have certain pathology tests that sometimes tell us to just leave that person alone. Maybe their tumor won't grow for three years, five years, 10 years. And then we can treat it when it does grow and in this days of rapid uh, 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 new knowledge about uh, neuroendocrine tumors, we might have a completely different treatment for them, a better treatment. The somatostatin receptors, I said on 80%, that allows us to treat the syndrome with octreotide. It allows us to use uh, that octreotide as an imaging agent. And what you hear about uh, very soon is using that same radioactive octreotide with a very hot radioisotope as a treatment, the PRT treatment that many of you are aware of. 
these receptors, as I said, there are five of them. They're, they're, they have different functions. Some, some cause secretion, some cause blood vessel growth, some cause cell growth, and some tell the cell to stop growing. Here's just a picture of an octreotide scan, and this is normal liver, normal spleen. I should, shouldn't read this with two nuclear medicine docs in the audience, but I'll just point out that this person had, had a, a parathyroid disease. They could see that, and also a pituitary tumor seen on the octreotide. This is a person with MEN syndrome, so they were at risk of having multiple neuroendocrine tumors. We talked about uh, the blood vessels and how rich they are in blood vessels. The reason is that these cells, these tumor cells, can make factors that stimulate blood vessel growth. And so it stimulates the normal blood vessels to come feed the tumor. It's very insidious. Uh, and there are different ways of inhibiting that. So if this is a blood vessel growth factor, VEGF, and it binds to a receptor on the tumor cell or on the blood vessel cell, uh, then, th then once it binds here, it, it signals, uh, it causes a, an enzyme reaction here, which causes a series of enzyme reactions that lead to cell growth. Now, in this particular situation, these are blood vessel cells, not the tumor cells, the normal blood vessel cells, with a growth factor that binds to a receptor on the outside of the cell that triggers growth of the cell, and then these, tumor, these, these blood vessels grow to feed the tumor. So you can inhibit it. You can inhibit it with, with a drug that binds to the growth factor. That's what Avastin does, or Bevacizumab. That made Genentech a, a several billion dollars a year. It's a, it's a blockbuster drug for Genentech. There's a drug which inhibits the receptor. This drug is called Remisurumab. It just had two positive trials in gastric cancer. We, have, we hope that we can use it for neuroendocrine tumors, but it's not yet in trials for neuroendocrine tumors. And then there are a number of, of drugs that can just hit this enzyme domain right here and knock that out, and that's what Sutent is, or Sunitinib, which is approved for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So in, in sum, the treatment algorithm is as follows. First, once we're confident with our pathologists and with our radiologists that we have a well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor, and if it's locally uh, or regionally extending, we send it to a surgeon to remove. We always consult with surgeons to see whether we can move it. If it's not amenable to, to resection and it's uh, and, and there's no symptoms associated, sometimes we'll just watch it. Literally, we'll just watch it. We'll get another scan in three months. If there's no change, we might get a scan in six months. If there's progressive disease or if people are symptomatic, then we need to treat. And we can treat with systemic treatments that you'll hear about later today, or we can treat with local treatments if it's liver-dominant disease. Liver treatments are, are putting catheters directly into the liver to treat uh, the disease there. So I'm gonna close with, by talking about some of the impediments to progress. First of all, we don't have good tumor models in the laboratory to help us predict what drugs work, what genes are, are most important. And there's lots of research going on right now to try to develop adequate tumor models so we can do better genetics to understand what's actually triggering the growth of these cells. We actually don't even have a great net database. It turns out that until about 10 or 15 years ago, this was not even considered a cancer for, in the cancer registry Therefore, cancer registrars around the country wouldn't necessarily put it into their cancer registry. So we're missing decades of data because of, of just nomenclature. So I don't want to scare anyone with this, but I refer to this as a cancer, and I insisted that the Stanford Cancer Registry started counting these as cancers about 15 years ago. And so we have a, a rich database, and, and Pam and her colleagues have actually developed that into a tissue and a database that she'll tell you about more later. And we also uh, need more clinical trials. We finally have drugs that look interesting. We need to test those drugs and find out whether they're effective. The only way, way we can do that is to test it on patients. So I think there are opportunities. I think there are new targets. There are new agents. There are new combinations of these active agents. Uh, there are positive randomized trials. In fact, one that you'll hear about that was just presented last Saturday, last Friday, uh, in Charleston at an international meeting. And there are new ideas that are bringing new researchers in the field. So although it's a rare disease that was neglected for decades, uh, it's, that's no, no longer true. There's lots of enthusiasm to come up with new treatments for this disease. There are drug companies that are competing for patients on clinical trials. And I think that this is, a, this is a, gonna be a, a time where over a period of five and 10 years, we're gonna see some dramatic advances. So with that, I'd like to close and give the podium back to Pam. Thank you very much.